Welcome to the Changemakers podcast produced by City Current and powered by Higginbotham. Normally, I'm your host, Jeremy Park, but this time we're flipping the script. And so I just interviewed Dr. Sarah Pechnik, the founder and CEO of Volunteer Odyssey. And we thought, how fun would it be for us to switch roles and have her be the interviewer and me be the guest. So I'm going to now take off the tie. So it looks oh, different since okay. I literally just interviewed her. And so now this will, you know, this will fool you into thinking it's a different episode, but we just, you know, uh-huh. just taped it. So yep. Dr. Sarah Petschnik, you're now the host. Take it away. All right. Do not adjust your dials. This is not a mistake. So this is the Change Makers podcast. And so I guess this is episode 89. Is that right, Jeremy? All right, so Jeremy is the subject of our Changemakers 89th podcast. And as you guys already know, this is from City Current, powered by Higginbotham. And we are very excited to have you get to know Jeremy a little bit. And so kind of how this came about, um, I had the opportunity to go on a trip with the City Current team to go meet the Higginbotham team in Texas recently. And uh, I got to see the tie off, Jeremy, which, you know, I feel like most of us don't get to see. Um, We're used to seeing you, you know, come in like all this energy at these breakfasts and things like that. And there is a lot more like happening around you that we don't always get to see when you're the host. So I asked Jeremy if we could make him the feature of one of these podcasts. So Jeremy, when I asked you that, what was your initial reaction? I said, sure, why not? So here we are. (laughs) So here we are. So I feel like you guys probably already know a lot about Jeremy because there are like these bits and pieces that come out. Um, But I just thought it'd be really fun for you guys to actually get to know more about Jeremy. Like you do such a great job telling everyone else's stories and making sure other people are in the spotlight. So wanted people to get to know a little bit about you. So In case we have anybody who doesn't know who you are, uh, Jeremy, why don't you just tell us a little bit about you and what you do? So it's always hard to answer that question. Meredith's always like, please don't ask him what he does because it's so hard to explain. But no, the role is CEO of City Current, powered by Higginbotham. I'm a shareholder in Higginbotham. There's a long storyline there in terms of Higginbotham. And prior to that, Lipscomb and Pitts Insurance and the amazing partnership and entrepreneurialism and everything that really has created City Current. But role-wise, CEO of City Current, I'm a shareholder in Higginbotham. And uh, the mission for City Current, power the good. So you see that everywhere. City Current is the electric current powering good in the community and the cities. And so when you look at it, we connect business with community to power the good. And we do that through events, media, and philanthropy. And as you alluded to, when you talk about kind of all the different connection points, we host over 300 events a year between Memphis and Nashville and now Texas and beyond. And we have a ton of positive media to power the good news. And so that's where five different TV shows, really six at this point, two radio shows, podcasts, it goes on and on, books, uh, all focused on spotlighting the good news and what's going on, but more intentionally, the lessons that are being learned, just like with the Changemakers podcast. And then philanthropically, we give money to nonprofits to support the mission and efforts. But we also focus, especially with our partnership with Volunteer Odyssey, on volunteerism, physical service. And so we're here to power the good. I'm here to power the good. And uh, that's my world. Perfect. So I think one of the things that I've been wanting to know, you spend all this time, all this energy, you know, helping power the good for everyone else. How did you decide that you wanted to do this? Like what about, you know, your, your background or your upbringing or your experiences made you think, you know what? I want to dedicate my life to helping other people make a difference and get connected. Yeah. So it it definitely starts with my parents and even my brother who's younger, three years younger, but the Mm -hmm. way that we were raised. um, So I was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We lived there for about eight years and uh, moved to my parents were high school sweethearts in Fort Worth, Texas. And so I moved to Weatherford, Texas when I was eight for the most part, and really grew up in Texas. And, you know, ever since we were little, my brother and I saw firsthand just how much my parents poured into the community. And I talk about it in the book and in giving for growth, but we had an open door policy. And so, you know, at all hours of the day or night, 2 Mm a.m., 2 p.m., people who were down on their luck, going through a divorce, a difficult circumstance, 
they would come over to the house and my parents would take them in. And my dad was in the insurance business. Mom was in education. And, you know, most of the challenges that people had had nothing to do with either of those. They just, they Uh needed some advice and they needed help or they needed, you know, to borrow something. And my parents were always just, you know, here to help and here to serve. And they were the first ones to sign up to coach sports, to serve in the scouts, which, you know, my dad to this day, he's been doing it for decades I mean, both of us are long gone out of scouts, but he's still doing merit badge colleges for thousands of kids. And yeah. he does it because he's like, you know, it's a way for me to help. I can do it. And, you know, and they just exude service. Right. And so okay. even, you know, my brother and I reflected, uh, you know, not too long ago, but just when you're little, you don't think about it, but our tennis coach, uh-huh. we would play tennis with him, you know, all afternoon. And then my dad be like, you know, come over to the house, use our racket stringer. And he would just come over and he would be stringing rackets at our house, watching TV with us, eating dinner with us. Like he was like a family member. And yeah, it sounds like it. But what we didn't realize is that he was going through a divorce and, mm-hmm. and he had a young daughter and she would come over too. And my parents recognized that he needed love. He needed support. He needed somebody right. to there. He needed a, you know, a hot meal. Mm-hmm. So he just became, you know, family. And, uh, but it was all because too, my parents took it a step further. They didn't have to do that for our tennis coach, but they noticed, right. you know, from an open heart standpoint, here's someone who's going through a challenge. We can mm-hmm. do something to help. Let's do it. And so, you know, our house was always the house that my friends would come over to. And yeah, you know, it was always like, it's not clean. Don't have, they would just keep on coming over. And, you know, she yeah, just kids don't care about stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, it's like our house became the center. And even to this day, you know, I'm, you know, my brother and I are both now in the Memphis area and our friends, when they come back to Weatherford to visit, they'll go to my parents' house to catch uh-huh. up with them many times before they even go to their family's house. Right. And so that was just how we grew up. Right. And so you, you, you kind of don't know that like, there's anything different. That's just the way you're yeah. supposed to do things. And, um, and, you know, we also saw, cause my brother served our country as a U.S. Marine. Um, and he enrolled the first day that he could when he turned 18 and, you know, did boot camp and served in every war that, you know, happened over the last two decades. Um, yeah. but service was just something that was instilled in us. And when you right. look at how I, connected with people, connected with community, built my career. Even in Los Angeles, you know, I ran Merv Griffin celebrity tennis tournaments. My friends and I had a group that we would throw events to be able to support nonprofits and do all these things. Okay. It was always just something that, you know, you, you're put on this earth with a small amount of time. You want to make the greatest difference possible and Mm -hmm. to be a light because so many others are going through darkness. And I've always kind of viewed that as That's just a part of it. And even recently, you know, um, Meredith, my wife and I were talking and we called my parents and Mm -hmm. we're saying, hey, here's something that we kind of need some help with. And they're like, got it. Yeah, done. And she goes, they didn't even ask for more detail. Like there was nothing (laughs) to do that. Like they were just like, yeah, what do you need? Got it done. Uh She's like, I want us to be like that for our kids, no matter what it is they call and they need help with. Yeah. Don't even ask. Got it done. Like that's That's why I love Dr. Meredith so much. (laughs) Yeah. But I mean, I think that's, that's where it starts, right? Like you, you, you definitely get older and you realize that's a blessing for sure. Mm -hmm. Like in terms of being raised like that, but it also does set the stage for how you view the world and how you view your role in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I I think it's so interesting because I didn't know that piece of your background and about your parents. And uh, I hope I get to meet them at some point. And so do they listen to your podcast? Are they going to listen to this one? Oh, yeah, they will listen. (laughs) Yeah, so the the irony of that is you were actually going to meet them in Texas. They were going to go to that. But my brother called and he's like, hey, I've got to go on this trip. And I really want to talk to my wife. And it's kind of our last chance to go and, and do a vacation. Could you come in and watch the kids? Right. It's very true to form. Yep. Got it. What do you need? Yep, be there. Absolutely. And so, okay. you know, because I, I see them a lot when I travel into Texas. And so I have a chance uh-huh. to catch up with them a lot more often. 
And so they came out and they were, you know, so I was in Texas and they came out here to watch uh, my brother Jeff's. So, so what you're telling me is the way to meet your parents is to have some sort of emergency where I need their help. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, yeah. If you, if you have a case. challenge, yeah, they'll show up. But yeah, but, you know, they're, yeah. they're just good people. And, you know, the other side of that too is, and we talked about this on the last podcast with you, mm-hmm. is that when when you volunteer and you serve, you're meeting people who care, right? They care about yeah. others. They care about the community. They're going to care about you. Mm-hmm. And it puts you in this world, this center of influence of just good energy, but good people. And right. you become surrounded by people like Johnny Pitts of Lipscomb mm-hmm. and Pitts and now Higginbotham and Rusty Reed of Higginbotham. And, you know, all of these amazing people who care deeply about others, about the community. And it also then reshapes how you view it because like you start being surrounded by all these yeah. people who are trying to create change in a positive way. Mm-hmm. And it ups the ante on what you think and know is possible, but what you view as your ability to be able to do and your goals to be able to do, to be able to make a difference. Yeah. Well, it's so interesting to hear you frame it that way. And I think hearing that story about your parents, it makes a lot of sense because, you know, I'm sure everybody listening has had some kind of interaction with you. And I remember the first time we met, um, I asked if we could go to coffee and just talk more. I just had this idea about volunteering. I remember we sat and you gave me all this amazing feedback and ideas and suggestions, and you didn't need or want anything from me. You had no expectation of anything. You just wanted to help. And I think that is one of the amazing things that you do and that City Current does is just like wanting to be this connector and this sort of positive influence in the community, which you guys do an amazing job with. And so for for you, like, you are you're constantly giving back and even like as we were getting ready to start you're talking about all these events that you're emceeing and you know all these volunteer activities how do you kind of take care of you when you have all these different things happening like every time i talk to you you have a million things going on how do you decompress or kind of balance that with everything else that's happening in your life yeah and i mean meredith she's like you're gonna die doing this <laughs> <laughs> Like it's just who you are, right? Like it's so. I I mean, I think look, you kind of have to know what um, your purpose is, what inspires you, where you draw your energy. And for me, like I'm, I'm definitely extroverted, right? And so I draw my energy from being around others by being able to help, and that's what fills my cup, and that is what allows me then to pour into others. Mm -hmm. And so. I think for me, I am one of those that likes to see that I can create impact, right? So it's 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 not just the theory of it. It's like, I want to go and tangibly be able to impact someone's life and mm-hmm. help them on, you know, whether it's idea generation or taking the next step or making a connection or whatever else, because to me, that's what fuels my fire. Now I have some other things like, you know, tennis or you know, tennis is probably the, the biggest one in terms of just growing up and playing that sport and being able to to kind of get back into it now and even coach our younger son, Kaysen, and be around his friends and, you know, volunteer coach their tennis team and all those. So that that's a kind of separate piece that to me is, it's not necessarily relaxing, but it, it definitely energizes me. Uh-huh. But I think, you know, I, I'm one of those that I will wake up and burn the candle all the way through and then crash and burn and do it all again. Right. And so I'm, I'm trying to use every ounce of energy I can every single day to okay. do what I can to continually take positive steps forward for city current, for Memphis, for Higginbotham, for, you know, Nashville, having a team there for Texas, for, you know, our nation and our world, because it's kind of that butterfly effect where, uh, you, you never know the difference you can make. I mean, every single moment you're making a difference somewhere, but you don't really know, you know, in many cases you may never know um, yeah, how much right. you're helping. You know, you look at that one conversation, you know, with you or one conversation over here. And yep. I just think back, so many people took time, intentional time out of their day mm-hmm. and their calendar to help me. The, you know, my pay it forward to honor them is to do the same and to help others. And, you know, many years from now, when you you talk about the legacy we leave, it's what people say about you. How did you make them feel? They're not going to remember how much money I made, you know, accolades. They're not going to remember anything like that. 
what yeah. they remember is how did I help them personally? And, uh, and so to me, that's the most important thing. Right. Absolutely. And I think you've done an amazing job, one of that, but also like building, building the team. And so through working with you guys more closely, I've gotten to know Andrew and I've gotten to know Allison. What are just one of, one of your favorite things about each of them? What makes them special? Sure. So uh, really all of them, Allison, Andrew, Eileen and Kelly now too. Um, and even you're a good example where I've known you for, you know, over the 10 years of Volunteer Odyssey, 11 years, probably 12 or 13 years now. We've been in the Mid-South for almost 17 years now, which is hard to believe. Yeah. Um, but Allison, I've known for over 13. Well, I've known her for longer than that. She's worked at City Current for over 13 years now. Okay. And, um, you know, I'll kind of give you a little bit about each one. But for Allison, she, the thing with her, she was running and helping her father run their family business. And so she knew a lot about a million different things, but uh -huh. very entrepreneurial, very driven, very, um, customer service. And, you know, I, I want to help you. And, and for city current, like you have to kind of have that mentality of, of mm -hmm. service, right? Like you've got to be wanting to serve both physically, but also obviously for what we do, like creatively and everything, like it all goes together to power the good. And so, the thing about Allison, the, the story that I tell that really articulates her curiosity, but her ingenuity and just her level of, uh, of, of taking the bar and raising it tenfold is this was years ago, but she uh, recognized that we needed help to redo our website. And so on okay. her own accord, she took the time to learn coding, how to develop websites, like all this stuff. And she, she comes to me one day and she's like, so... I, I know we need a website and I want to show you what I've been working on. And, um, you know, I, I kind of been teaching myself how to do this. And so Amazing. she put up this website that's basically like 95% done. <laughs> I'm just like, what? And she's like, yeah, I, 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 I saw we had a problem. I yeah. thought of a solution. And and she's so I, humble. Yeah. And I'm just like, oh my goodness, you taught yourself how to code and build websites and you built something from scratch. that was very complicated. <laughs> And right. it was amazing. And so yeah, building websites then is not like building websites now. That was a, a Herculean feat. Yeah. But it shows, and you know, for her to, it goes back even to the conversations that we had on your interview with the last change makers too, on the relationship, right? Like I, I knew her as a friend before stepping in, she had seen what we were building. She wanted to be a part of it. So she was already committed. There was ownership. Right. And so when you talk right. about that level of dedication, that comes from her ownership of it. And I think that's something that she takes great ownership in what we do. And, you know, she really is my right hand. I mean, I, I turn to her for, for so many things on just advice and um, perspective and, and shows she's been a, a really invaluable piece of the whole equation for everything we've done. Yeah. Um, you look at Andrew Bartolotta, our director of digital media, he's been on the team for over eight years now. And mm -hmm. uh, he's another one that he, was working at a different, he was working actually at a nonprofit and he had come out and always been a supporter of our efforts and uh, followed him on social media. And, and you know, just, I, I knew him kind of as a friend from coming out yeah. and helping us with different things. And I always admired his work and his creativity, especially around just how he was able to do things as a storyteller through digital mm -hmm. media. And I was like, he would be a great asset on our team. And there was an yeah. opportunity that opened that door. And I was actually speaking at, a, at an event. He was there we were talking afterward and he made a comment around uh, pursuing an opportunity. I was like, wait a second, you're, you're pursuing an opportunity. Like, what if you worked at city current? And he's like, <laughs> really? And I was like, yeah. And so I didn't I, know that story. Like, I love 24 that. hours after that, he was on the team at city current. And That's so, amazing. yeah. And, and I mean, and he brings just a, a wealth of creativity and, you know, it's been awesome really for, for both of them, especially to see how much they've grown and matured and, you know, personally, professionally, I mean, Andrew's now hosting the radio shows and podcasts, uh -huh. and he's a speaker now sharing the the digital marketing knowledge that he's, you know, constantly, um, you know, evolving on his end and, and being proactive with. And so yeah. the two of them are amazing. And then you look at, you know, Kelly Myers and Eileen Vick out in Nashville leading our efforts there, you know, five years. So, I mean, it's like mm -hmm. um, the longevity with the team and what they've done to, lift and create something special in Nashville. I mean, Eileen right. is 
all the events and logistics and she's just a rock and she's even gone above and beyond from a volunteer perspective with Samaritan's Feed and opened up the uh -huh. in other communities uh, to do all these shoe distributions and Kelly, same thing. I mean, you know, just putting herself out there and serving and even dancing with the Nashville star, like all these things that they're doing <laughs> to serve, to lead, to lead by example, to give back. I mean, right. it's, it's really just cool to see from my vantage point where it's like, you create a platform, you give ownership, and then what yeah. they create is so special, even above and beyond what you would imagine, you know, yeah. in your own regard. Yeah. So that kind of makes that kind of makes me wonder, like, what are some of your proudest moments over the course of doing City Current? What are a few that sort of stand out for you? I mean, that's it goes back to like your when I was asking you about you know favorite volunteer experiences like you you literally yep. can't people are like well pick, you know yep. who's your favorite speaker it's like there's been hundreds uh -huh. and, and, you know I know I'm turning the tables on you <laughs> yeah I mean it, it there's so many because you know when you look at at this point we've given a mortgage free home to a wounded veteran hero and to see the impact for them. When you look at 12,000 volunteers as a part of the Faith in Action and picking up litter, you know, across the community and what that was able to do for our city, that was huge. When you look at the Samaritan's Feet shoe distributions and now, you know, 13, 14, 15 years in the making, yeah. blessing thousands and thousands of kids locally and so many special moments just with each one of those, because what looks like a sea of chaos with all these volunteers and kids and, you know, washing their feet, their feet, giving you new socks and shoes and toothbrushes and toothpaste and, you know, all these things, there's all these special moments where right. um, you're being able to see just love and compassion and relationships form, you know, and one was a 15 year old girl who had never had her birthday celebrated. And so we stop everything and sing happy birthday. And that was her first new pair of shoes. And, you know, so it's like, there's so many special moments out of all yeah. these things that you do. Um, but I'll tell you, like, you look at Manny Ahomey and his family and how they become family, you know, what started as him coming and speaking. You look at Scott Hamilton recently and how much now we're doing with the Scott Hamilton Cares Foundation. Right. You look at all these amazing individuals who you you bring them in as a speaker and they share their story, but then you become friends with them. Uh -huh. and, uh, and, and it transcends business. And I think right. that's where then all of this stuff, it's like, I tell people like, that's, this is the starting point. This isn't yeah. the end. This is the starting point of an amazing journey that we're going to go on together. And I mm -hmm. don't know just as much as you do what the future will unfold, but it's going to be amazing because we have a shared heart to power the good. And so you just see all these things that, that magically happen that create these moments that you would never uh, think possible. I mean, you look at meeting Morgan Freeman, Bon Jovi. I mean, you know, like philanthropy, community service has opened up the doors to meeting people that um, would have never been possible before, mm -hmm. but it's also built around this shared goal of making a real difference in your community. Yeah. So hearing, hearing you talk about this and like mention some of these speakers, like I got to see Scott Hamilton recently speak and he's, you know, he's incredible. You guys have the most amazing speakers come. And I think a, a lot of people who interact with City Current do it through these, these breakfasts, which are so amazing. And so when people are coming to these breakfasts, what is it that you hope they walk away thinking? So when people come for the first time or if they've been to a bunch of them, they leave and you hope they say what? If somebody says, how is the city current breakfast? What do you want them to get out of it? I want to get involved. That's what we want them to say. I, I want to get involved in yeah. the community. I want to make a difference. I want to be a spark. I want to power the good. The, the, the power of the good becomes a personal mission that we want people to take on themselves, right? And yeah. so that's why we you see it on shirts and things like that. Like we want everyone to take ownership. Yes, you know, the electric current powering good in our community in our city that's what city current is but ultimately it's your ownership to be a community champion to be a spark to yeah. be a city current to be you know the electric current powering the good but you know when you talk about the events you know from an event standpoint and we do a lot of benchmarking with other organizations and we talk all the time for us it's a few things one is we view it not just as an event we view it as a show right and you have to be very mindful that you're producing I mean, I spent almost a decade in LA doing media. Yeah. You take that as a part of what you're bringing 
to Memphis to make it different is we view it as a show. So there's got to be a very high production quality. You start on time, you end on time, you, you have yep. these dynamics. But we also talk about the importance of understanding the content that you're trying to deliver, but also the energy you're trying to deliver. And so you kind of alluded to it on you know the energy side, but that is a big piece of it is understanding that I, as the MC, as the host, have to push out good energy on the show, yep. on the events, because from an audience perspective, if I'm not having fun and if I'm not full of good energy and smiling, you're not going to smile either. So yep. I have to engage people and I have to understand my role. And that's why I think when you look at, as you mentioned, emceeing a lot of these events, these nonprofit events, understanding your role in the in the scheme of the agenda of, okay, I've got to be the glue in between. I've got to be the transition. Right. But ultimately, like, I've got to make people feel like they are excited and belong and are part of something, are part of a movement. They're not just sitting in a chair at an event. Right. Yeah. And that's a big difference. And I think once you understand yeah. what your goal is and what role you're really playing, mm -hmm. and you kind of mentioned this on your legacy statement before, it's not about me. Like the reason I can get up and do all of this on stage is because I understand it's not about me at all. Right. Like yeah. I'm there as a vehicle to push out good energy and to ultimately hit the high points that we need to hit mm -hmm. so that in the end, people feel like they're able to make a difference and know how to make a difference and get involved. And that's, you right. know, the, calls, the action and all that kind of stuff are important too. But I think those are, th those are the differentiators for us. That's also to the way I view it. And that's, you mm -hmm. know, why city current and these events I think continue to remain relevant and successful in a time yeah. events are a real challenge right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think just hearing you talk about it, I never thought about that. Like you're, you're producing, you know, this, this show essentially, and it does, it always starts on time. It ends on time. The speakers are incredible. The connections that you make are incredible. Like I think at every breakfast, people walk away feeling like they are part of the community, which is a, I think a difficult thing to curate and is definitely a strength of city current. So for people who maybe um, aren't part of a company who is a city current partner, like how can just the, the average person take advantage of city current or be engaged and connected? Well, even going back to the original idea, because look, when we moved here 17 years ago, we didn't really know anyone. Mm -hmm. And, um, I just started volunteering and doing business plans. And that's how I met Johnny Pitts and, you know, Lipscomb and Pitts Insurance. Yep. And he's like, hey, I've got this networking organization. I need a blueprint. I need a business plan. And then obviously that's become city care. But, but one of the things that really struck me is, okay, the gaps around positive news, corporate social responsibility, using corporate resources to make a real difference, turnkey volunteerism, uh -huh. you know, all these things that we wanted to focus on, but also just coming into a new city, like what would someone new want to do? Well, you'd yeah. want to know where the family friendly events are, the nonprofit events, the things that are free. Like you mm -hmm. want a resource of where to go and where to grow and, you know, where right. to get plugged in and who to meet. And so that's kind of how that newsletter started was like anything and everything that I thought people just needed to know as a resource, a community resource. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. for us, as city current to be able to pull together these enrichment events, but also these events so that you can create purpose-driven relationships, okay. friendships, and also to like invite your spouse, invite your significant other, invite your friends, because yeah, let's face it, when you talk about talent attraction to a city, it's around opportunities or connections. Okay. But when you talk about talent retention, yep. they have to be connected to the community. And volunteerism right. plays an important role, but friendships form, to me, the core foundation of how do you retain all this top talent, the people? How do you get them to want to stay and, and love the city? They have to feel connected. And so right. that's, to me, that's a you know another kind of big piece of City Current is we want people to feel connected. We want them to have those relationships at a deeper level that make mm -hmm. them excited about yeah. you know, living in, in Memphis and in Nashville and make them excited about want to make a difference. And so when you look at how we're structured, you have the corporate partners who basically pay in, you know, annual dues. And there are partners and we have charter partners and uh, they get to kind of host one of those signature speaker series events with a guest speaker. And they play a little bit more of a prominent role in some of those. And then you have our partners, but together these, the partners 
Um, you know, and it's cool when you look at the cross section of global companies like International Paper, AutoZone, yeah. FedEx, Truck Pro. Like, you know, we've got a amazing Delta Dental of Tennessee, like all these companies that are very large all the way down to small entrepreneurial, you know, Napa Cafe, Germantown Day Spa, Anastasia's yep. like, you know, future lifestyle management, an entrepreneur. Like we've got all these different companies, sizes, um, representatives that, that come out and they basically pour in and that's our budget. And it's very much a zero sum game. It's like, we're going to uh-huh. have everything and do everything. And our charitable giving all comes out of that. And then we do it again the next year. And so it's right. It's it's designed as a give back, but it's playing the game of corporate social responsibility, even before all that was a buzzword of using uh-huh. yeah. to give them an ROI so that they can double down and, and open up uh their their wallet, so to speak, to invest in nonprofits. And you know, why is that so important? Is because individual giving, foundation giving, and then down here at the very bottom is corporate giving. And we're trying uh-huh. to open the floodgates so that we can get the corporate giving at a much higher level because companies see how easy, but how productive it is to get involved in the community. And so then when you look at the corporate partners funding everything, we invite the public to come out and participate. And for those who aren't, you know, necessarily corporate partners, there's a million ways they can get involved. They can partner with volunteer odyssey and get involved in corporate compass. That's a big one for us. Yeah. Uh, because the categories are exclusive on the partner side on our end, which you know does does limit it there. Right. But anybody on our end can plug in, come out to these events. They can get involved with Volunteer Odyssey. They can buy Giving for Growth. It's cool that all of a sudden like there's thumbs popping. Yeah, up. I know. Uh, the book. Wow. Um, they can do the shirts that give back. The Power of the Good shirts. Um, yeah. They can do our our city current community fund. Those are great shirts, foundation. by the way. Those shirts are really soft. If you don't have one, you need to get one. Yeah. And we have hoodies and stuff too. So it's like there there's go. a million ways that that anyone can support the efforts to power the good. And yeah. at the end of the day, we're just trying to make it as easy as possible for mm-hmm. everyone to play a role in making a difference. Yeah. So one of the ways that you have done that is you've written a couple books, which is pretty incredible. Can you talk a little bit about what is your writing process? So I think lots of people have thought about writing books. It's an intimidating process. How did you actually kind of uh, like approach it and get through that whole process? Yeah, so I'm I'm very different in the sense that um, I I I'm ne- I've never considered myself a writer and. The whole irony of that is, so it started many, many years ago. At this point, mm-hmm. it's probably been, wow, 14 years ago, maybe. But anyway, yeah. so I was I was at a lunch, James Overstreet um, with the the Daily News at the time. Uh, it, he, he basically said, hey, we're at executive lunch. He's like, all these things that you're learning and talking about, have you ever thought about writing a, a, a column? Uh-huh. And it's like, no, but I'll give it a shot. And he's like, well, write one and then send it to me and let's see what we can do. So I wrote one and he's like, write another one. Keep it, let's keep this going. And I was like, what are you going to do with them? Well, I, you know, so then I write like three or four and he's like, so you have a column now. It's going to be a weekly column. It's kind of like called Impact, and it's going to be in the daily news and it's going to be every week. And I thought, okay, I'll run this for like, you know, 10 weeks and then I'm done. Right. Uh-huh. A decade, like literally a decade, <laughs> every single week. And I'm not a writer. Like, I don't like writing. Like, it's it's not like I can do this all day. I can talk. Uh-huh. Like, it, it, I'm, I'm not a natural writer. Like, I have to sit down and I, because of my mom and like education, like I have to have a complete <laughs> sentence and then I go on to the next complete sentence. And even writing emails, <laughs> I write a complete sentence, no contractions. And then I go back and do the contractions, right? Like, right. I, I, it, it's just, it's, it's not one of those that's free flowing on my end. Uh-huh. So anyway, it was, that's the whole irony, the whole thing. Well, so, and then it ended up in the commercial appeal, like the long, amazing story with the giving back column in terms of the legacy and really cool storylines on that in terms of like <laughs> one lady, it was so meaningful for her. She would print up copies and put them on like windshields at grocery stores. And I would get calls <laughs> saying, why is your column on windshields of all these cars? The I was like, it's not me. And so it was, just, it was this sweet old lady that just, she loved the column and the positive news. And so just amazing stories that I gave back. So this book, this book publisher comes in, he's like, Jeremy, have you ever thought about writing a book? No. Well, you've already written one. You just don't realize it. You've got all uh-huh. these columns that right. we can 
freshen up, get quotes from the executive directors, add some calls to action, and, and let's do it. Mm -hmm. So that became the first book, Giving Back with Purpose. And I learned a lot in that process because we basically said, look, everything we do is philanthropic. If we do this book, it's got to give back 100%, right. which was awesome. It gave back, it supported all these youth literacy programs. But because there was no really reason to promote it, you know, it, it basically sold out of the one run pretty fast. Uh -huh. and, we and, and there really wasn't a reason to do more because there was no like marketing support because it was 100% give back. Right. <laughs> Not profit. Um, right. So the second book, though, I learned like if I'm going to go through and write these weekly columns, I'm going to now think about it as writing a second book. And I'm going to uh -huh. do the lens of all these mm -hmm. lessons that we're learning and sharing, and I can be intentional as more of a platform to really leverage this idea, right? And so I don't remember how many years ago it was, but there was like a period where we got snowed in for like three or four days. And I literally knocked out uh, giving for growth in that period, pulling some of the ideas from all these other columns that I had written yeah. and then crafting you know, a new version. And so uh, I learned a lot in that process, but that has become Giving for Growth, kind of the, it's the second book, but it's how to achieve success in a way that benefits the community. That's become our platform. I mean, I'm speaking at two events this week, you know, based on it. And it's become, you know, an opportunity for us to kind of share the lessons of what we're doing with City Current in a very different, more personal way, um, which has been really exciting. But, you know, truth be told on that, my writing style, like I'm not a professional writer. So what's funny about that and, and you know. I don't know. Now you might be a well, professional writer. <laughs> no, so so Meredith's like, I, I'm not sure I can read because your style is like so different. It's how you talk. Uh -huh, <laughs> it's, right. it's like, but I mean, you know, look, the fact is uh, it's, you know, I'm not a writer, but at the same time, I've got the books, but I'm, I'm humbled in the sense that people, you know, have read the book. Um, but that it actually has helped them and it's allowing us to do all these amazing things, um, which I couldn't have dreamt of otherwise. And so it's, it is really cool to be able to have giving for growth and, you know, obviously giving uh, back with purpose prior to that, but I'm just excited because it's, it's sharing all these lessons in a different way. And the idea obviously is to help people. Uh-huh. So if somebody is thinking about writing a book for the first time, um, it sounds like your advice is wait for a blizzard. <laughs> but if somebody is thinking about writing a book for the first time, what what's some advice that you might have? I think it's really interesting you describe yourself as not a writer, right? You've been doing all these columns and these books, I think. But in some ways, that makes it approachable for other people who might want to do it. So what would you say? Oh, yeah. I mean, if I can do it, anybody can do it. And I mean, the <laughs> irony of that is, you know, a decade long column. And uh -huh. then writing for Forbes as a contributor, like, yeah, so that that to me is the greatest irony of this is, well, two big ironies in my life. One is growing up with my dad in the insurance business, he's always like, you know, come on, kids, I want you to get in the family business, get into insurance. Uh -huh. and my brother and I like, no, I'm going to go as far away from that as possible. My brother uh -huh. and me going into media and, and tennis and all these other things. And now the irony is not only Where? did I work for <laughs> Lipscomb Pitts Insurance, you know, but when we merged with Higginbotham, you talk about full circle where Higginbotham, you know, is the company that my dad helped them launch their employee benefits. So I go back, you know, yep. these are all lifelong friends with Rusty and Michael Parks and Jim Hubbard and all like, you can't get any more full circle irony than that. Exactly. And then exactly. the second is, you know, not being a writer and all of a sudden then doing all these things with writing, uh, uh -huh. which has opened up all these doors. But yes, don't let that intimidate you in terms of writing, sitting down and, and sharing your story. But I think for those who really do want to write a book, a few things. One is um, start. Obviously, you know, you kind of mentioned is you, you be intentional, make the commitment to start. Mm -hmm. But when you do, you know, from a business perspective, there's a lot that goes into that, right? Like what are the main lessons that I'm trying to articulate and get across? Who is the reader? You know, like there's a lot that goes into from a marketing standpoint, the things you have to do and kind of figure out ahead of time. The other things really is like beta test, right? Like put yourself out there using social right. media and speaking at events and things like that, because you need to refine your craft and see what's going to resonate. What stories resonate? How do I tell this story? Mm -hmm. Put it out there like any good comedian. And you start to think right. like, you know, okay, is this getting laughs or is this not? Is this story, you know, resonating? Is it sinking in? Is it not? 
And, and that will help you crowdsource a little bit to be more effective in terms of what you ultimately put in the book. Because mm -hmm. the other thing you go into as an author, and this is where author, musician, whatever it is, the game has changed. Um, you have to have a following. You have to have a brand before any sort of company is going to look at you. And so you've got to do that hard work on your mm -hmm. own to build your brand, to build your following, to build right. your audience, to beta test and start crafting the content that's going to go in. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing that is, I have a lot of friends who, you know, are working on or have worked on or done their first book. And, you know, one of the things that I uh, tell them is if you want kind of the secret inside track, most of them use ghostwriters. Like they hire someone who's a professional who mm -hmm. will interview them, get all those great ideas out, and then they know how to craft that story in their voice. Oh, okay. Now, pay money to do that, yes, but you come back with a finished product that's marketable, that is top notch, and that has access to publishers that normally you as an individual, mm -hmm. especially if you don't have name recognition, would never have access to before. And uh -huh. I think in all truth and honesty, if I was to redo it over again, I would go that path. You will find mm. out really fast. I wrote my own book. <laughs> <laughs> Just like I mentioned before. Um, but I mean, you know, it's authentic. It is 100% authentic. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I feel like that fits with the brand too. Yeah. I mean, for better or worse, right? But, well, um, and, you know, it kind of makes me think of like, you know, helping, like there's no perfect way to help, right? Like just deciding to help and go make a difference. Like, you know, it just, it is what you can be and do in that particular moment. And so, you know, for you, it's like, here's the message I'm trying to get out and maybe it's not perfect, but it's authentic and it matters. And this is how, you know, I can help. I think it's really cool. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, part of it is coming to terms too. And so tennis music, like I've done all these weird things and you look at it and you think, wow, how, how this guy bounces around like a pinball, how do they all connect? But they all do. <laughs> And the thing you learn from it with tennis, like, especially you're going to fail way more than you succeed. You're going to lose way more than you win. Mm -hmm. uh, and in hitting shots, you have to have a very short memory to forget, to be able to play effectively, to then go on to the mm -hmm. next level and, and, and to win these matches and to come back. Well, music is, you know, with music, you put out a CD or an album or a song and it's, it's what it was in that moment when you recorded it, right? Like it, yeah. Music in a book, like it's in that moment. It's an ever evolving mm -hmm. storyline that continues to grow, but it's you in that moment. Right. It's like a and snapshot. Think, yeah. And you have to come yeah. to grips with that is like as a perfectionist, you'll want to go in and continue to redo it, reanalyze, uh -huh. you know, whatever it is. And it's like um you have to come to grips with it's in that moment the best product and you're putting out, you know, in, in that time period, but that conversation, who you are will continue to evolve and grow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so, and you actually got to one of the questions I was going to ask, which is, you know, you, you were a huge tennis player, still are a huge tennis player. And what are some of the lessons you took from playing tennis and applying it to now, which you kind of talked about a little bit, anything else you want to elaborate on there? How does, how does playing tennis prepare you for life and the business world? Yeah, I think with any sport, um, when you go all in, so with tennis, I mean, I grew up playing every single day, four or five hours, weekends, all day, traveling all over Texas and even the world playing tennis. Um, you, you know, when you look at it to that, and it was my career, I mean, for five years in Los Angeles, I was the head tennis pro at Beverly Hills Country Club. And so, um, and that's a story too, in the sense that I go out, well, a couple of cool stories, which I know is longer, but we'll fit it in. So um, in college, I was a marketing major and was doing, you know, all this volunteerism with Actors Preparatory Studio and taking acting classes because I always wanted to go out to L.A. My dreams were tennis, music and acting. And so was playing tennis, was doing music, was taking acting classes. So I get to graduation and uh, the lady that owned Actors Preparatory was like, look, you're the first one in, you're the last one to leave. You're volunteering left and right. You're helping me sell out these shows with no-name actors. If you can do it with no-name actors, you can do it with big actors. I'm going to do you a favor. So she opened the door for me to become the director of marketing for uh, a production company. Oh, okay. But it goes back to volunteerism, right? Like er every yeah. sort of thing in my world connects to volunteerism. Right. And so anyway, she she put herself out there, got me that job. Well, two years in, um, I learned so much you know, about the TV industry and TV specials that is now mm -hmm. the Spark Awards, like all the stuff we're doing 
They, these are all the lessons that I learned along the way, but they went to Florida to take on a big project. So I was jobless in LA and, you know, sent out an email and my old coach, one of them was, was Mike Estep, Martina Navratilova's coach, a lot of connections with Beverly Hills Country Club. And they basically said, you know, I got a call the next day from Trevor Sands, director of tennis. Hey, Jeremy, if you want to teach tennis, I got a place for him. Like Beverly Hills Country Club, like that's a dream job for a tennis player. <laughs> right. And uh, so, I mean, and that threw me into this world with Merv Griffin and doing his celebrity tennis tournaments and people like Paul Reiser and Matthew Perry, sadly, you know, you know, but meeting these individuals and being able to play with them and teach tennis to them and stuff. And even the the tennis pros coming in, uh, Jan Michael Gamble and Derek Rostagno and really just cool experience. And once again, I was the first one there, last one to leave. And that's what Merv Griffin saw is like yeah. the professionalism. I want this guy running it. I want him running the, you know, be the head pro. So right. all of that led. And then Cindy Clark is a big tennis player. And that's how I got over to Dick Clark's radio side. So it all goes back to tennis and yeah. everything being involved. But tennis, this is what I, you know, talked to Kaysen about our younger son is the discipline, the commitment, the focus, the the going all in, you know, when the chips are down, finding a way to still persevere and come out on top, but also the sportsmanship and the care because you know, there were some not so great moments where I was uh, in the finals of a big tournament and losing and I was getting frustrated. I was getting beat. I was like maybe 16. I was getting beat by like a 12 year old. Um, <laughs> but I mean, you know, these are amazing players. <laughs> and now we're like, <laughs> professional. but like, right. I mean, that's very humbling. And so oh, I, yeah. I said something I should not have said. And I threw my racket down and I don't think I broke it, but I, I, I was angry. And yeah. my parents walked out of the stands and basically like pulled me off the court and said, you're done. And mm. when you default, you lose all those points. Like, so I, uh, I basically threw away that whole tournament, which was a big tournament. So I was devastated. I was mad. Yeah. What? And they're like, no, we don't behave like this. Mm. Well, I've never thrown my racket yeah. since. And I've, you know, like, right. I, like, so there are certain things from a sportsmanship standpoint, and I volunteer coach the middle school tennis team with Germantown Municipal School District. And over the last really three years, watching those players grow and mature and evolve. Um, but there were moments where you kind of had to say, look, that's not appropriate behavior. Yeah. That's how we act on a tennis court. But then right. watching them take that to heart and become better humans, you know, yeah. um, is really cool. And for me to see that with our own son and for him to go through you know, losing a tough match, but having the perspective to realize it's tennis. Like, you know what? Yeah. Like, let's go and do something now fun as a family. Like right. there's certain things that you reprioritize, but you also understand effort and what it takes to be successful because like he's now realizing that the effort he was putting in was maybe 50% at best of his real potential. But here's how he has to dig down in to get to that next level of effort, which then yeah. becomes the norm because the light bulb goes off. And I think all of right. us, once you realize, like, oh, wait a second, I'm 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 putting in, but I'm I'm really only putting in like 50% of what I'm possible, you know, to put in, my, what my potential is. There's so uh -huh. much more you can tap. And so yeah. being able to realize that uh to me is a powerful lesson. And I mean, I'll say with tennis, especially like even here in Memphis the people that I've met have become lifelong friends. Uh, there's just something about putting yourself in and playing at a level where you respect each other's games and right. you respect each other as people and you respect what you've accomplished. Even though I blew my arm out and you're like going out, you know, and playing now I'm playing these guys who are half my age. But even <laughs> then uh, there's a respect that's generated where you respect the game and what you've put in and you're frustrated, you know, sometimes with the performance as you get older but you also then have the respect for those around you that builds these really lifelong yeah. things. Right. Yeah. And I think it's interesting hearing you like talk about how you approach business, how you approach life, how you approach tennis. Right. And it's ultimately like your character, right? Like yours and any, you know, that you choose how that's going to show up. Right. And everything that you do. Um, and so that kind of leads me into some of my lightning round questions. You ready to start lightning round? Sure. Uh, so my first question was going to be, what what are two proud dad moments that you have had, one with each of your sons? So you started talking about Case and tennis a little bit. What's a proud Case and dad moment? What's a proud Cooper dad moment? I think, well, so for Cooper, he's now on a full ride at Alabama. And to watch him, 
kind of if you're looking for specific moments, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you you do all these things, and it's hard to do this in a lightning round, but you you pour in and you do all these things and you you have them participate with you, but you don't know if it's sinking in. And right. so it gets to to University of Alabama and um they're having these club days. And so we're talking to him and we're like, well, have you, you know, signed up for any clubs? Like, what are you doing? He's like, no, I've created my own. And we're like, what? <laughs> He's like, yeah, so I've created my own, the Crimson Club, and it's around volunteerism and service and taking people's um, skill sets around research and helping them match up with nonprofits. And I'm like, both Meredith and I are like, what? And he's like, oh, and we have like hundreds of people that are already signed up. So- <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. So you like in that moment, you realize, wow, all these things that we've talked about and relationships, yeah, they all mature, <laughs> like the, the light, it, that was really cool. And then for Kason, I think, um, you know, I'll go to the tennis one because for his team to win state and every single match, they were down facing adversity for him, you know, both as a team to watch it, but for him to watch like the confidence build and then, when they won state and they realize, wait a second, we can do this. Like, wait, what? Uh, we have we have the skill set and the potential yeah. to do this. He's now a different person. He's a different player. He's a different kid. Um, and so you could kind of see like this really special moment that has created a, a, a really powerful flip in his mind of confidence of realizing I can do this. So I think yeah. that's for each one of them kind of a special moment. Yeah, I I love that. Um, yeah, and sounds like between your parents and you and I just always call her Dr. Meredith. Can we call her your better half, Dr. Meredith? Your better 100% half. hundred yeah. percent, my better half. There's no question. Like I, you know, you hear the married up, you know, whatever. Like she, th- that could be a whole podcast in and of itself. But <laughs> I knew the first time that I met her, I was like, uh, this is the woman that I'm going to marry, um, and she is, you know. Uh, I, I was coming down an elevator. I, I'd already like met her through a friend. We have a uh-huh. mutual connection, Molly, who connected us. But I knew the moment I saw her, I was like, ooh, I'm going to marry this. <laughs> um, like there's, she's absolutely beautiful, completely like the smartest person. She keeps me grounded, but she lifts me. Like she's my better half on everything in terms of like my confidant, my best friend. Like she's everything. But but she's also too, like she's the one that has allowed when you look at city current, everything, you know, that we do to have, because she's just as much a part of this as Allison, Andrew, Kelly and Eileen, yeah. because if she's not, you know, helping our family and, and me, right. like this doesn't happen. So she's yeah. very much, you know, an integral piece of city current, um, mm-hmm. just like anyone is because she's the whole backbone of it. And, and, you know, when you look at what she means to me, to us, to the city, uh, yeah, I mean, she really is. Uh, yes, she's Dr. Meredith Park, but you know, for me, she's literally like my whole world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that might be half the reason I hang out with you, is so I can spend time with Meredith. <laughs> yeah, I don't blame you. She she is the fun one. Like, it's true. Like, so I'm you know, business. We'll make it fun. Uh, you know, I'm I'm the one. Like, even if you look at our friend group, like there was uh-huh. the three. It was me. Uh, you know, when you look at our, our real good friend, Anthony Cava, Brian Leinbach, the three of us, we all played a role. So yeah. Brian was like the crazy fun, like energy, you know, like I'm going to bring it all. We're going to do all these, you know, amazing experiences. Anthony, the empathy, like love, compassion. I'm going to hug, you know, everybody make mm-hmm. them feel like they belong. And I'm the one that's like, I'm going to make sure everybody's connected and valuable. And like, you know, and obviously yep. too, but like I, we all play a role. Meredith, uh-huh. like she's the fun one. She's going to bring the fun and <laughs> make sure that everyone has a great time. I will make sure that everyone is there and they're connected yeah. and the energy is uh-huh. good. Like she's the fun one. And uh, she's also the loving one and everything else too. She's the one that remembers everybody's birthdays and follows up. Yeah. And, like she is a thousand percent my better half. Yes. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I hope she's listening to this whole one. Yeah. Um, okay. So true or false? Well, we already covered the tennis thing, but uh, you were an actor and you were in a TV commercial. True. Uh, you were the lead singer of a rock band. True. <laughs> All right. Tell 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 them a little bit about like the the competition that you did that you were telling me about. Well, the the fun. I'm um, really both of those. So the commercial wise, I mean, there's still some out there like BC Powder and. Um, oh, I didn't know that yeah. one. Yeah. And then uh, like, there's 
TV shows and movies and stuff. The, the irony of that one, though, is, is that typically with most, and there's a whole Power Ranger story that, you know, at some point we'll have to get into. I've got a lot of fun acting stories. Oh, I should have asked way earlier. I'm, I'm usually the one the that gets cut. Story. Like I have a great scene and then I get cut. So I'm in the credits <laughs> of a lot of things, but you don't actually see me. So even Meredith's like, how do you always get cut? I'm like, I, I'm just that guy. Like I'm on the cutting room floor every time, but there are some commercials. So where you I can leave room for other people to be on screen and tell their stories. You're the connector, uh, yeah. right? Yeah. But I'm in, you know, this, the cellular South commercial, like I, all of those that became ceasefire, like you, you see me a lot in, you know, some random commercials, but anyway, um, so with the music, yes, I went out to LA and, and all through college was writing songs. I mean, you know, hundreds of songs, singer songwriter, Went out there, had a development deal. Me and our guy, um, we produced the you know five songs, and he ended up getting dropped. And so the label's like, "Look, you, you've got a fully produced thing. Why don't you put together a band and come back to us, and we'll see." And so uh, met this lead guitarist, and he through college, his friends like had a band, and they're like, "Look, we're really serious. If you're serious," and so. I gave them my demo. They learned that. And I mean, literally like the next day we were playing together as a band and I learned their songs. They learned mine and we were out hitting the road and we started, you know, passing out CDs and building an email list. And this is, I mean, this is, you know, 20 something years ago. Mm -hmm. um, this is 25, six, seven years ago. Like it's crazy. Yep. How so it wasn't like there was no YouTube and all that kind of stuff and social media, like none of that was in, in existence. So we're doing it the hard way, getting all the emails, but we're selling out shows. And um, yeah, we got a, a call from HBO's Last Man Standing. And like, look, we're producing the show and the winning band oh, amazing. Uh, gets a, a touring contract. And anyway, so we we played this Henry Fonda, like huge show in LA. And uh, we had no idea what we we're getting ourselves into. And uh, it was it was amazing. Like it was thousands of people in there and uh, all the media and we walked out and played one of the coolest nights, like outside of our kids and all the stuff, like for me personally, uh -huh. one of the coolest nights definitely in my life. Uh, Cause yeah. it's one of those rare things where like everything was perfect. Like it was, it was great. And I, and the crowd was singing back our songs louder than we were singing. Like it was very surreal. Yeah. And, uh, and, and then we won. And so that's that amazing. was the greatest thing. And then it was also the worst thing because we were not ready by any stretch of the imagination to be a band, to be signed, uh -huh. to be that stuff. And so it was like, you know, boom. And then just boop, <laughs> pretty fast <laughs> after that. But we had some cool moments where um, Anthony Cava, who's like my brother, he was able to join us and play on tour with us. And so to see, you know, guys like your brother next to you at a sellout show in front of thousands of people playing songs that you wrote, um, you know, was just really special memories that I'll forever cherish. So it's yeah, just cool stuff like that, that, uh, you know, we don't really talk a lot about just because it's not relevant now for everything, but cool moments when I look back at just, you know, special moments in time with special yeah. people doing something that's uh, really cool. Mm -hmm. Like peak life experience is really cool. Um, okay. Do you have a morning or evening routine and what is it like? Well, so right now, Meredith and I both wake up at 6.30, 6.35 to be exact. I set it for 6.30 and then I pause it for 6.35. And then I get, and then we, we help Kaysen get, you know, because he's not a morning person. So we get him off to school. That then sets my day in. So usually I'm like, you know, out here in the office working at like 7, 7.30, knocking out stuff, full day. And then, you know, coaching tennis or playing or whatever else in the evenings but Kaysen plays just about every day. So I mean, either I'm coaching him or we're taking him somewhere or I'm playing uh, and then events and stuff like that. And then usually I'm in bed by 1130 ish. Okay. I'm a night owl like you. So it's like, it's, you know, yeah. it's, it's hard to go yeah. to bed before midnight, but I really try hard. Well, especially if you're getting up at 635, you have to go to bed before midnight. Yes. I've never been a morning person and I'm not an extrovert. So whenever you guys see me at the city current breakfast, just know that this introverted night owl is, is doing her best. <laughs> um, do you collect anything? Mm. Besides experiences? Uh, not, not really. I mean, I've got, uh, 
growing up, I collected, you know, football cards and stuff. And so I still have those. Like I was looking the other day, I've got Troy Aikman, Deion Sanders, Emmett okay. Smith, like all those rookie cards, which is pretty cool. You know, now um, I, Meredith would say I collect tennis rackets at some point, but I've given a lot of those to Tennis Memphis and other nonprofits. So I've donated this and now I'm down, uh-huh. down to a manageable number. Um, not really though. I mean, I don't really collect, like, I'm not a super sentimental person, which is mm. terrible because, uh, I mean, I guess I really, I didn't keep anything. Like when you look at our band experiences and even tennis and all, I just assumed that someone else was doing that. It's so, <laughs> like, all these things that we did, um, I never really kept. And even like Beverly Hills Country Club, which I kick myself now. But like, uh-huh. like when I when we moved we when we moved here, I like donated all that stuff. So shirts, you know, all these things that had Beverly Hills Country Club on it, like all, uh-huh. all that cool stuff. Like I just gave it all away, donated <laughs> goodwill somewhere. And Very like, on brand. <laughs> yeah, and it's like now I kind of wish, like I kind of wish I would have kept some of that. Just uh-huh. is cool memories. Like I've got one jacket, you know, like all these things where it's like, I, in the moment I'm like, Oh, I minimalist. Like, I I don't need that. Like, let me give it to somebody else. Let me do this. Mm -hmm. And then like, you're like, Oh, I kind of wish I would have had some special moments and memories, but uh, I, I tend to give it all away and then regret it later. (laughs) I don't have anything (laughs) to show for it. It's like, I got this great story. I can tell you. I do have the guitars, you know, still from those, which, you know, but that's about it. Yeah. Okay. We'll do like a, a Jeremy scavenger hunt. Maybe your mom has a secret stash in the attic somewhere that she hasn't told you about yet. You know, what's funny is, uh, so I'll go on eBay every once in a while and just like, you know, search and I've been able to find like some of our old, you know, like CDs or uh-huh. it was for sale for like $500. I was like, that's, that's, if they can get that, that's impressive. I'm not going to buy yeah. a CD for 500 bucks. <laughs> maybe you like, should re-record it you know like taylor's version you can do it yeah, again that's, yeah i mean i think that would be more money than we ever made even playing professionally so it's like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like only like, appreciate it after your time yeah, you know? exactly yeah but like i don't <laughs> yeah yeah all, all these things like oh maybe maybe i'll find it someday um okay and then um for somebody who has like a dream and they're thinking about moving towards it what what's what's a short piece of advice that you would give them you, you, you know, you talked about this on yours, but so, you know, my, my kind of vantage point on this is I, I tell them like, okay, you need to define your purpose. Like for us, it's parked on education. And so when you look at for myself, for Meredith, I mean, especially in her career in education, education for us is where we really focus in on as a family and as individuals. So new leaders and organizations that we really volunteer heavily with and financially support it's centered around education and really Delta Dental of Tennessee too. When you look at Smile 180 Foundation, a big part of that is around oral hygiene and education. And so mm-hmm. it, for us, defining your purpose. And then, as you mentioned, being intentional, like blocking it off on your calendar, putting it on your calendar. You may not even know like what you're going to do at that time, but like literally putting it on your calendar and then figuring out like, okay, what am I good at? What am I passionate about? And for me, like marketing, MCing, like these are things that I I enjoy doing, I'm, you know, somewhat good at it. Like I, you know, for me, it's an easy thing that I can do that plays a strategic uh, value for that organization. Right. And so it's, do I have camera equipment? Do I enjoy taking pictures and being social media? Like, do I have uh, a, a vehicle that I can use to go pick up toys for tots or what, you know, like doing an allocation, your asset allocation, like what do I have? What am I good at? And then how can I leverage it? So defining your purpose, writing it down, carving out the time and putting it on your calendar, and then being intentional to figure out what do I have? What am I good at? And then going to like volunteer odyssey and saying, okay, how can I serve? Here's what I want to do. Here's what I'm accomplish. Here's my mission. Like here's, here's where I want to go. Help me now find the nonprofits that align start dabbling and volunteering. And then you'll find really fast, which ones do you want to go in deeper with? And then mm-hmm. like water naturally seeks this course, you will start getting yeah. involved. And right. I think that's, you know, I, on my end, you know, doing business plans and marketing plans for nonprofits, emceeing, like doing mm-hmm. the things that I'm good at that I know will add value has always in return yielded amazing, you know, friendships and things that right. I mean, have created city current. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay. And last question, if people want to know more, if they want to be involved, where do they find you and how can they follow City Current? So citycurrent.com is the website. Our handle on social media is City Current. For me personally, it's jeremycpark.com is the website. Jeremy C. Park is the handle on social media. So super easy to find. Email jcp, so my initials, at citycurrent.com. But, um, you know, we're here to help power the good. We're here to power the good, but to help you power the good. So all of that goes together. And I think, you know, just like on your end with Volunteer Odyssey, whatever role we can play in getting people involved and being a resource and uh, being a catalyst, that's what we're here for. That's what we enjoy doing. And that's the mission is all of us working together to power the good. Perfect. All right. Well, lots to bless for everybody to think about. Um, Jeremy, thank you for being my hour um uh you know interviewee for this um podcast for change makers uh what do we need to do to wrap up just say thank you sarah for hosting so it was fun and we hope obviously everyone enjoyed this a little bit of a different spin but uh i appreciate you sarah for even thinking of this idea saying hey let's flip the script and thank you for letting me talk you into it (laughs) yeah no it was awesome so Thank you, and uh, thank you for all you do as a change maker. And honored to be a guest on the Change Makers podcast. So thank there you, you for tuning in. Higginbotham Insurance and Financial Services is proud to power the Change Makers podcast. We're a people first company that protects what matters most: the families, businesses, and trailblazers that keep our community going. As one of the nation's top independent insurance firms, Higginbotham is a single source solution for business insurance, employee benefits, HR services, and personal insurance that's customized for you. We're here to serve you, the people you care about, and your community. Call 866-377-1959 or visit Higginbotham.com.